Hello Euro Squad and welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at Joseph Stalin and the iron-fisted dictatorship that the Man of Steel is going to create after the end of Lenin's rule in Russia, in the Soviet Union that has been created since the Bolshevik Revolution. So the Man of Steel, he is going to remove all opposition uh, through our video lecture today and you can already see how he's starting to do that here in this slide where we've got Lenin right here that is overseeing the party faithful that are faithful to Stalin okay not the old guard because the old guard is going to be removed from power and killed and sent to the gulag and he will pers personally sign the names of 40,000 or 50,000 uh, people that will be sent either to the gulag or to their deaths and so these guys that you see here are the party faithful that remain faithful to him and down here you can also see some of the various sycophants for Stalin as well now up in the corner there you can see all the different uh like areas of russian society that all worship stalin love him i mean they're sitting on his lap like he's santa claus and looking over this whole thing of course is the spirit of vladimir lenin so joseph stalin is going to find ways through propaganda through mass appeal the typical type of um totalitarian regime uh, methods that we talked about in a previous video to gain power here and isolate and eliminate all of his enemies. And when he was a young lad, his father wanted him to be a priest, an Orthodox priest. So he studied for the priesthood and was kicked out promptly uh, for bad behavior and uh, his atheism. So then after flunking out of the seminary, he decided to get into a life of crime. He was into bank robbing. He was into, uh, you know, stealing from the rich and giving to himself the poor. And um, what he ended up doing was joining the Bolshevik party just before World War One. And then he is going to end up in exile out of Russia during the war. He will help though to bring Lenin back to Russia uh, toward the end of the war and then help to bring about, of course, the Russian Revolution that will take place and, um, you know, leading into the October Revolution. He was vicious, absolutely vicious. Joseph Zhukashvili took on the Nome de Guerre Man of Steel because he wanted everyone to know how vicious he really was. Now, there's been some psychoanalysis of the man, although that's very hard to do because he's dead and, you know, it, hard enough to psychoanalyze a, a living person, let alone someone that's been, uh, that's dead. But uh, some psychoanalysts of Stalin takes a look at the fact that he also had a physical ailment. Now his physical ailment had to do with, I believe it was his left hand. His left hand was severely scarred and never grew properly because as a young man, his, his abusive drunken father was beating him and, um, beat his hand with a, a fiery log from uh, from the fire pit in their home and beat his hand so badly that his hand never really recovered from it. And so he was always kind of hiding his hand. Sounds kind of like Gimpy from World War One, right? Uh, Wilhelm II. And uh, Stalin always wanted to hide that that issue and so maybe he's like i mean freud would look at it as he's overcompensating some of the terrible things he's going to do are part of overcompensation so as you heard joseph stalin's reign of terror that he is going to create is going to lead to so many deaths now we know of three million deaths for sure because those are the numbers of people that have been unearthed from mass graves since that time however there may have been even more than that there may have been as many as five million people that uh that stalin's um, reign of terror killed either directly from him ordering it or through uh, the massacre of what are called kulaks people that resisted because they wanted to own their land now it didn't have to go that way that's what's so crazy is um, under Vladimir Lenin things looked like especially under the new economic policy and some of the the uh, decreasing of some of the, the strict nationalization and communist policies that we saw uh, during war communism, Lenin in his new economic policy in the last few years of his life um, was far more of a leader that uh, was was trying to find a compromise to make this program work. Now, might he have taken it, if he had time, might he have taken it into the next realm of, of nationalizing everything once again and going strictly communist? More than likely, yes. But he chose to do it in a way that was far more, I would say, democratic in a way because Vladimir Lenin was... Uh, a brilliant man. He really was an idealist. He, um, you know, was able to harness the power of the state and, and win the Civil War violently. But at the same time, I really believe from having read some of his works that there were, you know, there was a different plan in place that he had than certainly the direction that Stalin will take it. Certainly, after Lenin dies um, in 1924, many people 
didn't want Stalin to be in the party uh, anymore. They didn't want him to be the leader of this thing. They wanted Trotsky to be the leader of this thing. However, things will get a, a little bit mucked up here because of the fact that Stalin is in the most important position in the government to be able to solidify his control. And that position is the secretariat. He is the secretary of the Communist Party, and therefore he's the one that has the lists of all the names. He's the one that has the bureaucracy in place to be able to wield the, the the mechanics of power here to his benefit. So Lenin actually put it into his will um, that he wanted Stalin removed from the Communist Party. He wasn't willing to tell that to Stalin himself while he was alive, but he was hoping that upon his death, there would be a thing called the party collective that would be established. All right, so the party collective is is more of that communist ideal that Marx had talked about where it moves from a dictatorship of the proletariat into the more idealistic side of a, a government that is run by the workers Soviet. Okay, so he wants a party collective, that more idealistic thing. Not a dictatorship under Stalin. He does not want that. However, um, the man that's in charge of making sure that everyone hears about Lenin's will happens to be Stalin. Okay, so it was kind of a funny thing because after Lenin dies, they're going to have this huge funeral in Moscow. Everybody's coming in from all over the country to come and visit. All the big wigs of the Communist Party are there to be a part of this funeral. And they even did this weird thing with Lenin's body where they were able to preserve his body so that it did not start to decompose quickly. And they were able to like keep it in state so that you can see it in this glass box still and go and visit Lenin's non-decomposing body. It's crazy. They're, they're trying to make him like a messiah almost, right? So Stalin is in charge of running the funeral. Now what he did was um, he sent out the invitations to everyone, but he made sure to send out the invitations to his people with the correct date. Now the people that he didn't like and he thought were going to be opposed to him politically, guys like Leon Trotsky, he sent them invitations with the wrong date. So Leon Trotsky was not at the funeral. He actually showed up three weeks late, which was a huge embarrassment and made him look really bad here. Whereas Stalin, he was planning this whole thing, right? So Stalin at the funeral, uh, they had the, the, the big funeral and then they had the reading of the will. They're reading it before the whole party that's there and said, uh, someone needs to remove Joseph Stalin from the party. He is a dangerous man, said Vladimir Lenin. Well, Stalin was kind of watching this whole time and keeping tabs on everyone that was looking around. And if you saw anybody nodding like, mm -hmm, yeah, we really should get rid of Stalin. Stalin's marking their name on a list. And that list is of the people that will later be shot and killed. And then anybody that's kind of looking down like, nope, I disagree with that. I'm not even going to look at Stalin. Don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Those people, of course, are going to end up on his good list of people not to get shot in the middle of the night. So the party collective is what Lenin wanted. That's not what we get. The reason for this is because um, Stalin, using the powers of the secretariat, is going to find ways to mechanize against Leon Trotsky and all of his followers. You see, Leon Trotsky had a different ideal from Stalin. Leon Trotsky wanted a permanent revolution, and what that meant was he wanted Comintern, the Communist International, to work around Europe to create this global revolution that Marx had idealized and visualized from the very beginning. Trotsky believed that there's no way that Russia can survive with their revolution if it's just Russia. If it's just the Soviet Union, it's not going to last. They need other countries. So he's working with Germany. He's working with France. He's working in England to try and foment revolutions there as well, hoping it'll spread around the globe and protect communism as an international thing. Now, obviously, we that are fans of democracy and, and you know capitalism don't want that to happen at all. But at the same time, Stalin certainly doesn't want that to happen either because what he wants is socialism in one country he believed that socialism will not survive unless they have a dictatorship of the proletariat in the soviet union right now and protect what we've gained so far in russia and then eventually through winning wars and doing other you know things like that we're going to spread communism to the rest of the world but for now we only focus on russia all right this is doesn't seem like maybe that big of a reason to want to kill 50,000 of your own people, but it will become the way that like the dividing line between who's faithful to Stalin and who's faithful to Trotsky. Well, Trotsky is going to get expelled from the party in 1929 as Stalin is, is grabbing power ruthlessly and killing off anyone that disagrees. And then uh, Trotsky will go into exile and he'll end up by 1940s actually in Mexico, hanging out with a commie, a fellow commie by the name of Frida Kahlo. She's the unibrowed artist, right? That you always 
So he's sitting like that. So uh, he'll he'll be hanging out with Frida Kahlo, and uh, Stalin will send some henchmen to go and murder him with a pickaxe, an ice pick, to the back of the head, right at the base of the cranium there. So yeah, killing him dead, and therefore ex you know removing all other power. Uh, that could be in his way. And so Stalin is going to begin is in the 1930s, his five-year plans. Now, I want you to think about this for a second because Germany had six-year plans. Um, America had the New Deal. Stalin had five-year plans. Everybody's got all these plans in order to rejuvenate the economy as quickly as possible. Stalin's five-year plans will come at a heavy cost, but what he's trying to do is convince everyone in Russia that this is the ideal way to fix our country, bring us out of the, they don't have a Great Depression, but just bring us out of the, uh, the problems that Russia has got converting to communism. And some of the propaganda he uses at this time, you can see the symbolism here. We've got Marx, we've got Engels, we've got Lenin, we've got Stalin. I don't see Trotsky anywhere in that list. It's just the, the, the perfect lineage for Stalin to use that. So here's a little video that talks about how he's going to accomplish this. So as you heard it from the video there, we had peasants that were resisting this, and they were the ones that were going to get shot into mass graves to the number of three to five million. Um, but the propaganda of the era, Stalin is going to use mass propaganda to make it look like these collectivized farms or state-run nationalized farms are a communist utopia. And the way he did that was they had all these factories that were producing tractors. And these tractors were red tractors because, you know, communism, red. So red tractors that they were providing for free to these collectivized farms and made it look like there's an abundance of food, they're getting everything they need, and, you know, they get tractors on top of it and weird fact as well there's going to be a lot of communist art coming out of the Soviet Union at this time uh, whether it be books movies or paintings um, a lot of it had to do with tractors like they really idealize these tractors anyway point being uh, he'll make it look great while at the same time he's creating one of the uh, the biggest famines in world history and I say one of because a previous video said it was the biggest man-made famine in world history but actually Mao Zedong is going to beat that record by killing over 60 million of his own people, um, a lot of it because of famine. And where do you think he learned these tricks for his great leap forward? From Stalin's five-year plans, which he also called a great leap. So because of his five-year plans, Russia is going to end up becoming the second or third most powerful economy, industrial economy in the world. They're going to have uh, a bunch of food for the cities, but famine conditions for the rest of the populace in the countryside. So what would his response be to the deaths of all of his own people? Well, here's another video to show you just what kind of ruler Stalin really was. Jeez, what a guy, am I right? You definitely do not want to live in the shadow of that nasty mustache. Uh, you might re remember the quote from Books That Changed the World about, um, about Karl Marx, saying that if Karl Marx lived during Stalin's time, he wouldn't have made it long. He would have ended up in a gulag or he would have been shot in the back of the head for being too much of an idealist and a uh, theoretician. Stalin is going to change everything here in Russia, making it so that the new state religion is communism and uh, all of the propaganda going along with it. So before the Bolshevik Revolution, the Eastern Orthodox Church was a very strong cultural component of Russia. And uh, a big part of the Eastern Orthodox Church was to have icons. And so every home, every church had icons everywhere. And so Stalin um, decides to make sure that this religion is very much an, um, uh, an anti-Christian kind of movement, is an atheistic kind of movement. And so the new state religion, or the new religion is a state-based religion, a communist re religion. And so all of those uh, pictures of Jesus, um, you know, doing this kind of thing or sitting on the cross, that kind of thing, that's all going to be replaced by now pictures of Stalin. All of the churches, the beautifully ornate Orthodox churches that Russia once had will either be blown up and blown to bits or they will be replaced uh, with all of the religious symbolism be replaced with things like um, statues of Lenin and statues of Stalin sitting there holding children on his lap like Santa Claus like yes I will give you all the gifts of the world including death and the bullet in the back of the head <laughs> here you can see some fantastic propaganda of Lenin 
pointing the way. And who does he have watching this whole thing go down? And as his sidekick, Joseph Stalin. And here are the workers saying, yes, come listen to this man. Come and join us for this wonderful program of reforms. This is the portrait that's going to hang in everyone's home. By law, by the way, has to be in every home. So no more pictures of Jesus. Now it's Stalin. And uh, you can see some of these other things too, just harnessing the, the power of the workers as they are unifying in their quest to make Russia an industrial superpower. And I mean, uh, Stalin will increase industrialization, as I said, but uh, they will also dramatically increase electricity throughout Russia. They will also um, dramatically increase literacy. Liter illiteracy rates were somewhere around 70 or 80 percent in Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution. And it'll be the exact opposite after the first uh, five-year plan goes into effect. And of course, the only thing they're reading is communist literature, but still they are becoming more literate, which you could argue is a good thing. But collectivization is going to be the ultimate, um, uh, ultimate terrible experience for the peasants because there were a group of peasants called the Kulaks. The Kulaks were uh, typically peasants that had already owned their land before the revolution. They were people that maybe had a little more money, were a little more successful at farming. And these were people that did not want to give up their gains that they had gotten over their 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 generations. They, they didn't want to change their methods either. There were a lot of people that were resisting uh, tractors and, and different planting methods, um, and they refused to go along with this program. So Stalin is going to forcibly do it by gunning them down or sending them to gulags. These gulags will be placed primarily in Siberia Siberia. There will be work camps uh, very similar to places like Auschwitz, except the there will be no um, gas chambers. There's no mass execution through that, but instead there is execution by working you to death. And there are some harrowing stories that come up, come out of it. Like uh, there's an author that I'll tell you about again during the Cold War time period, but his name is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he ended up in a gulag during the Stalinist re reign of terror, and he'll spend a couple decades there and write books about it and be released later later in the 1950s, and his story is a stirring and scary story of what it was like living there in the gulags. Well, the Stalinist terror also focuses on the party faithful, or the old guard, as they're referred to. All right, they're called the Great Purges, and in these Great Purges, um, he gives us an interesting quote. He says, ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? <laughs> okay, um, and so Stalin's plan is to do a bunch of show trials, okay? And the show trials are, are an effort to make these people look like they are criminals against the party and against, more importantly, the people. Uh, they always have to confess crimes against the people. For those of you that have read 1984, you know that uh, 1984 is based on the Stalinist terror and Stalinist system. And so these show trials are much like what Winston, uh, Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford will go through as well, where they are, you know, pledging to, or they were, they are saying they committed crimes they never committed because by thinking of these crimes, by thinking anything against the party, that is the same as committing the crime. Essentially in Stalinist Russia, the revolutionary thought is the same as the revolutionary deed. I mean, if you're even thinking it, then you have already committed thought crime and you are now guilty of the act. The best solution for that death. Stalin says, death is the solution to all problems. No man, no problem. Okay, well, there you go. Uh, so these show trials will involve around 40 or 50,000 people, and Stalin will personally sign the, the warrants to arrest these men that are his former colleagues and friends in the Communist Party, many of them uh, diehard Bolshevik um, fans of Lenin or Trotsky. Uh, they're strict Marxists. These are people that just don't see things eye to eye with Stalin, so he shoots them in the eye or you know, behind the head and kills them. So there are at least 8 million people that were arrested. Millions were executed. This is including the Kulaks. This is including those numbers there as well. But um, I mean, this guy's a mass murdering lunatic. And of course, he will be the one that ends up being our ally in World War II because you see war makes interesting bedfellows. Now we get a quote here in a poem from a, an old Bolshevik who was a part of the Bolshevik party and he wrote some poetry uh, before being killed by the Stalinist terror and it goes something like this. We live not feeling the country beneath us, our speech inaudible ten steps away, but where they're up to half a conversation, they'll speak of the Kremlin mountain man. His thick fingers are fat like worms, and his words certain as pound weights. His cockroach whiskers laugh, and the tops of his boots glisten. 
and all around his rabble of thick-skinned leaders, he plays through services of half-people. Some whistle, some meow, some snivel. He alone merely caterwauls and prods. Like horseshoes, he forges decree after decree. Some get it in the forehead, some in the brow, some in the groin, some in the eye. Whatever the execution, it's a raspberry to him, and his Georgian chest is broad. So that is from Osip Mendelstam uh, in the poem, We Live Not Feeling. And uh, I think it's a perfect way to close with a discussion of just how the Stalinist terror has been affecting Russia. Now we'll get more on uh, Stalin later, but we'll, in our next video, take a look at the rise of Adolf Hitler as another totalitarian dictator.